Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos on this beautiful feast of St. Luddite. I hope you can survive without your phones this morning. As Unitarian Universalists, we affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all people and gather together in a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Whoever you are, wherever you are on your life's journey, whomever you love, you are welcome to be part of this community. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors or first-time guests we have with us here this morning. I would love to meet you over some coffee and conversation in our fellowship hall after the service, answer any questions you might have about your experiences here or about our faith tradition, introduce myself. I will be manning a table in there after the service, and I'll explain why later on. For now, please uh, close your eyes for a moment as we center ourselves for worship. Feel yourself grounded in your seat with your feet on the floor. Breathe deeply. Become aware of our connections to one another here through breath and through earth, and let us begin. Out of depths unknown, the spark of life ignites, and we are born. We enter a world a universe not of our making. Our lives unfold in mystery and wonder. Questions abound for which there are no definite answers. And so we gather in community to seek in one another assurance and recognition, compassion and strength. We gather in community to be reminded of what is most ultimate, and what is most sacred in this spirit of searching and of reverence, come, let us worship together on this beautiful morning. Would you all please rise in body or spirit and join in our opening hymn number 57. Please remain standing and join in our affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve life in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony. Thus do we covenant with each and with all. 
Please be seated. Candles have been lit this morning for all of the technical staff working on a Sunday to restore our internet infrastructure. <laughs> and for John Biederman's aunt, Ellie, who passed last week. For all our joys, all our sorrows, whether we share them with one another or we hold them close and quiet in our hearts, let us be together now in a moment of silence. Please join with me now in a spirit of prayer and reflection. Eternal and beloved, gracious source of all life and all love, we gather together this morning with gratitude for this time out of time, which we set apart so that we might become more fully present to each other, to ourselves, to that which we call holy. May our joys be celebrated together our wounds be healed together, our hearts be opened together. Great mystery, whose reach spans beyond the cold, distant edges of our universe, and yet is present within the vast subatomic emptiness, coursing through every fiber and every breath of our being, and through being itself. Help us to see the miracle in the mundane, to see the crystal stars, the shape-shifting clouds, the patient trees, to see each other through fresh eyes, for it is so easy to forget, to forget that we truly are and what we've been given. As we move through our lives, let us remember to see through the mundane to the miracle beneath and to perceive that common substance that gives birth to our myriad forms, that mystery that spans beyond the edges of the universe and yet infuses our next breath. And let this foundational awareness guide us on our paths as we work towards peace and fight for justice, while always informed by a spirit of compassion. All this we pray in the names of those known and unknown, present and absent, remembered and forgotten, in the names of all the helpers of humankind. Amen.
Nobody needs to come down to the rug this morning, but I still have a story for you all. One day, when Nasruddin the Hoja was working in his garden, he became very warm. He sat down in the shade of a walnut tree, and making sure that no one was about, he slipped off his turban to cool his bald head. As he relaxed, he meditated upon the beauty of nature and the great wisdom of Allah. Observing a fine pumpkin in the garden, he smiled to himself. Allah, your ways are great indeed, he mused out loud. But there are a few things that I would have done differently if I were in charge. See the proud pumpkin growing on a spindly little vine? And then consider the walnut, a tiny, inconsequential nut upon a great and lordly tree. Well, if I had been planning things, I would have reversed it. I'd have hung those pumpkins in all of their glory from this magnificent tree and let the tiny walnuts cling to the spindly pumpkin vine on the ground. So musing, he closed his eyes to dream of the other things he might have done differently. A gentle breeze stirred the branches above him. Suddenly, a walnut fell from the tree and landed with a thud on top of the hoja's bald head. As the pain spread, he rubbed the lump that had begun to swell on his scalp. Then an understanding smile spread over his face. He bowed down towards Mecca. Oh, Allah, he murmured, forgive me. Thy wisdom is great indeed. Suppose I had been arranging matters. I should just now have been hit upon the head by a pumpkin. Ah, Allah, great indeed is thy wisdom.
It was spring break of, I'm going to say, my sophomore year of college. I was living 1,200 miles away from home. It was certainly not cost efficient for me to go back for the week, and so I was going to hang around the dorm. And then my best friend Chad at the time invited me to come along with him and his father to go spend a long weekend at a little cabin they had at a place called Arrowhead Lake somewhere in central Wisconsin. And so happily, I went along. I got to spend quality time with my friend, and I got to spend quality time with my friend's dad, Dick, who was just an awesome human being. And for a whole day at the cabin, we had a grand old time, spending time outdoors, shooting the breeze, talking smack to one another, just having a good old guy time out in the woods. And then the second day, Chad and I stopped really talking to one another. I don't remember what the source of the argument, what the breakdown was at that point, but I still remember just being really, really annoyed with him, and he was really, really annoyed with me, and by day three, we had retreated to our separate corners, and we weren't talking at all. We were just kind of grumbling and grunting, and meh. And that night, after a dinner with absolutely no conversation, Dick walked into the living room where we were sitting in our separate corners with his jacket on and said, put your coats on, boys, get in the truck. We're going shining. Now, I had no idea what shining was. But Dick Kopensky said, get in the truck, so by God, we were getting in the truck. And so we drove out in the dark of night along the trails in the woods around the cabin at Arrowhead Lake. And occasionally, he would stop. He had a little kind of police-style spotlight on the corner of the passenger window that he could turn around and he would shine it off into the woods. I didn't know what he was looking for. And Jesus said, we're looking for deer. We're going to find them by the glow in their eyes. And so every so often, he would stop by the side of the road and shine the light off to one side or another, trying to catch the reflection of those deer eyes. And the woods were dense, and we really couldn't see much until we got to a point where there was a clearing and a hill headed up no trees. And Dick shined his spotlight off to that side, into that glen, up that hill. And the whole hill lit up with the reflection of eyes of deers, countless of them. They had settled in for the night. And they were all watching us wary because there was a truck in the middle of their, their sleeping arrangements. And we stopped there for I don't know how long, just watching the eyes of the deers reflect back at us. And it got quiet. And all of the, the, the crankiness and the annoyance started to just kind of drift away, at least from my body. And we could all feel it in the truck, too. And once that had all dissipated, Dick Kapensky, Kapensky turned around and said, there you go. Now, don't you two feel just kind of stupid? <laughs> and yeah, yeah, we did. This is one of the... Uh, touchstone episodes of my life. This was actually the cornerstone of the very first sermon I ever preached in a church before I had even gone to seminary. It's one of those things I hang on to like a totem because it reminds me of what it feels like to pull my head out of my navel and reconnect with the world, to stop spiraling down into myself by experiencing a moment of awe 
and wonder. Now, these last few years have been a time of, I think, self-reflection for a lot of us, sitting alone with our thoughts, even if we are in a room with someone. This time has given us a lot of time to look inwardly and start to think about what really matters in our lives. And that time is good, and that introspection is good. Self-reflection is needed from time to time so we can get back to those basics, get back to that knowledge of what it is that matters most to us and to our relationship with the world. But, and I don't know if the experience has been the same for all of you, but for me certainly, as someone who is given to introspection at the drop of a dime, Sometimes self-reflection layered on top of a feeling of isolation can start turning into self-absorption instead. The navel-gazing gets deep. I start falling into my own head and the wheels of my own brain a little too completely where, to the point where everything is shut out but my own thoughts and the loops they make and the noise it makes. Post-COVID, and I had it back in June, the experience has, has solidified. All throughout the pandemic, I've said out loud, the brain fog is real, but I had no idea how real it was until I was actually in a time of recovery from the disease itself. And I was happy to see an article in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago validating my experience and letting me know I was not alone in that. I described it the other day to some folks as feeling like my brain is made out of silly putty. And it takes a lot of effort to stretch that out into the world beyond me so I can have experiences and pay attention. Paying attention has become a chore. I have to really focus, I have to really force myself, otherwise what happens is I decide I need a cup of tea, I walk through the living room, I ask Jess if she wants one too, she says yes, four seconds later I've completed my journey and I'm just staring out the window at the front yard. Don't remember what I came into the room for. I started at times to have to narrate my own life to myself in real time so I can remember what it is that I'm doing, just walking to the kitchen going, tea, cup of tea, cup of tea, cup of tea. It takes work. My attention needs intention. Otherwise, the silly putty just does what it does and snaps back into shape and draws me back into myself. And then I'm alone with my own thoughts again, shutting out the world, listening to the thought loops that happen over and over again, listening to the white noise that likes to play in my brain when nothing else is going on. And if I stay there too long, I start to mistake the center of my own thoughts as the center of the universe. I get disconnected from my sense of connection to the world, to the true center of all things. So what do I do in moments like this when attention takes intention and I'm prone to just falling back too deeply into my own interior world? What do I do? Get in the truck, we're going shining. probably less effective here where the deer are so prevalent and they meet me outside in the mornings at breakfast time. The wonder kind of diminishes a bit. But the activity remains. We go out in search of wonder, of awe, when we start to get too wrapped up. Ethan Cross, who's a psychologist at the University of Michigan, defines awe and wonder as the feeling we get when we encounter something powerful, so powerful that we can't easily explain it. And I think it goes a little more 
than that. For me, wonder is an experience that reminds us that there is something bigger than me and all of us, something all-encompassing. And the sense of that bigness, the sense of that all-encompassing whatever, rather than making me feel small and insignificant and one leaving me to wonder whether or not I matter in the scheme of all things. Instead, that bigness tells me I have a place in the grand scheme of things. I have a home within the vastness of all things, of all time and all space, and that all-encompassing something is always there welcome me back when I forget where I was. Wonder brings us home. Now, this is not just me waxing rhapsodic about the place of wonder in the world. There's been research done on what happens when we go out and experience awe for ourselves and what it does to our mental health and our physical health. Research shows that cultivating moments of awe are key elements in refreshing our mental energies and releasing a lot of our anxiety in the world. They've done brain studies with fMRI machines showing people videos designed to instill moments of wonder in them and then scanning their brains and finding that The brain's activity in its default mode network, which is associated with our sense of rumination and interior self, that diminishes as we experience moments of awe and wonder. In one experimental group, people were asked to draw pictures of themselves and their relationship to the world, and they always were center of the page and rather large, filling up the page. And then, again, they would be showed similar videos designed to instill awe and wonder, and then they were asked to draw themselves again, and almost every time, people would draw themselves much smaller than they had before, a little off-center from the page. As we tap into the sense of something larger, our sense of self shrinks, and so does all the mental chatter that happens in that default mode network in our brains. We transcend our frame of reference by expanding our mental models and developing new ways of thinking by seeing ourselves differently in relationship to the world. Our awareness of the world around us expands the connections we lost sight of, are redrawn and re-highlighted. Our place in those connections is revealed to us once more. Wonder brings us home. David Fessel and Karen Ravich are a physician and a psychologist, respectively, whose whole business is going out to corporations and nonprofits to help groups work on their group skills of resilience and well being. And this idea of cultivating moments of awe and wonder is key and central to the work that they do. They hand out strategies to corporate bodies and to individuals to cultivate those moments in daily life, to make them easier to find. And it could be as easy as this, starting off a meeting with your board of directors by asking, what took your breath away this week? Asking you to think about something differently before we do the business in the room, seeing outside yourself. It could be sharing personal photos with one another of things that bring you a sense of awe and talking about that. And on an individual level, it could be as easy as taking an awe walk. Going out into the neighborhood, maybe walking a path you walk every day and intentionally focusing enough outside of yourself to see things 
differently, to see things anew. Maybe go out walking with your dog and see what the neighborhood looks like to the dog. A whole different path opens up and you see things differently. Better still, doing it out in nature, untouched by civilization, perhaps, taking an awe walk, getting a sense of the power of nature around you, reminding yourself that the rhythms of nature are something we are part of, too. That we are part of a natural world and not just our own interiors. Awareness expands Connections are redrawn. Our place in those connections is revealed once again. Wonder brings us home. Like the hope I spoke of last week, wonder requires our participation. Our attention needs intention. I got to drag on that silly putty a lot in order to stay connected to the world around me. And it's a struggle to stretch that stuff out but the struggle has value for itself because the rewards of the effort are immeasurable in what they do for us body and mind and soul. And it doesn't require us to have a pickup truck with a spotlight attached to it, although that is an awesome metaphor for what I am talking about here. Making time to get into a vehicle that's not just your body, Having some kind of thing to hang on to that forces you to focus on specific things. Practicing with intention, the focus of our own intention on the world around us. Shine the spotlight where you know you are fed as a soul, as a whole person. Now, that looks different for everybody, I'm sure. And for me, it looks often like once in a while pulling over to the little overwork, overlook on the main hill road and taking a look out over that vista and reminding myself that I've always wanted to live in the mountains and a landscape like that because I feel at once small in the face of everything and yet so strongly grounded that I know I have a home there. Or it could be a small thing as just watching a video of an artist at work, watching them create something beautiful, how their hands work. That's my jam right now. I'm especially into woodworking videos right now, especially people who uh, do the art of Japanese joining, cutting all those intricate notches and tabs to hang wood together just by its own power in these beautiful patterns. Or maybe it is connecting with the deer. I've got to admit, as much as I joke, it diminishes here because they are so prevalent. When you've got one in particular who keeps coming back to see you in the morning, it changes your perspective on things one who doesn't seem afraid of you, one who wants to take a couple of steps towards you, so I step back because I don't want to get into it. <laughs> but having those quiet moments in the morning with a piece of nature that I'm at once alien from and so connected to, looking into one another's eyes as we stand still saying, well, here we are, <laughs> sharing space. Two blips on a pale blue dot. That's us. Yep. What were you worried about before you walked out the door? How long the drive through line was going to be about Starbucks? Well, don't you feel just stupid. Yeah, the brain fog is real. And the world, sure enough, gives us plenty of reasons to want to retreat into our own internal lives. And it is so, so easy to disconnect from everything and get to the point where we might mistake our own interior world for the center of the universe. But before we disappear ourselves, stop a moment. 
and take the time to cultivate just one moment of awe in the world, however grand, however small it might be. Start your day perhaps by just asking yourself, what is taking my breath away right now? What is taking my breath away? The center of all things will do the rest. The center will call us back to our place and welcome us in time and time again, no matter how many times we forget. Wonder brings us home. May it be so. As we prepare to return to our everyday lives, it is time to give something of the gifts of this community back to the larger community we are part of. It is time for our offering. During the month of December, as is our tradition, all cash and undesignated funds we collect will be given to our friends at Self Help Incorporated in support of their work on our behalf in the communities of Los Alamos and Rio Riba and Santa Fe counties, giving a hand up to those who are most in need. You may give in the basket as it comes by today. You may give in the collection box at the back of the sanctuary. And as always, you can use your GiveLify app and select self-help this month as the recipient of your donations. The offering will now be accepted. May what you give bring you joy and a deeper relationship with this community. So this week and last week, I've talked a lot about the intentionality that it takes to have moments that get you to reconnect or give you hope. And throughout this whole church year, I've had this kind of repeating theme about the need to get deep with yourself, to find the full human within yourself, to connect with others at a deep level, to learn from their own depths so that we become a community of whole human beings connected to something larger than ourselves. And, and talking about it is great, but handing everybody opportunities to actually experiment with that is another thing. And so starting next month, we are opening up a new program tied into the Soul Matters themed ministry that we've been using for years. These are the Soul Matters circles. It is a form of what we call small group ministry. The small group ministry in general is a gathering of six to ten people with a connection to the congregation who get together monthly and take some time to share deeply from what is within themselves and listen deeply to one another and lift up gratitude for how our depths intersect and teach us 
each other. Now, we've had small group ministry programs in the past. It's been several years now. And those of you who might have participated in them before will remember that they were often rooted in just talking about what was going on in our lives in a present moment, or they were intellectual experiments and reading something and discussing it. But the soul matter circles are different. Each month, they are tied to the same theme that I'll be preaching on during the month, that our kids will be learning lessons from during the month. This month is wonder, as you can probably tell from this morning. And Soul Matters gives its participants a whole menu for the month of various spiritual practices that you can engage in. Ways to engage in the theme that are more soul-based rather than mind-based. You only have to pick one of them, and there is a wide variety to choose from, speaking to all interest levels and learning styles. And then the group gets together to share with one another their experiences of engaging in the practice. And then there are also questions for contemplation and deep discussion around that as well. But the heart of it is spiritual practice rather than the intellectual exercise to go deep in the soul and share that depth with one another. So, beginning tomorrow, because the internet is down today, we will start taking registrations for people to participate in our first round of these Soul Matters circles. We only have three groups to start, which means we are limited to 30 people, but don't let that hold you back from signing up. We will start a waiting list as well, and as groups continue, we will find new people within them to become group facilitators as well and open up more groups as more facilitators are trained and grow into the program as well. I will be in the fellowship hall at a table. I have samples of the participants' guide for participating in Soul Matter Circles and some of the packets for the themes with the various spiritual exercises in them, so you can take a look at those as well. And then watch your email this week for a sign-up form that you can do online, and then we will have paper sign-ups next week when I can print things to sign up as well. I hope you will consider it. I'm here to answer any questions you might have about the program, and I hope you enjoy it. On top of that, you can find all of the important announcements and upcoming events on the back page of your order of service, on our email announcements list, if you haven't signed up for that already, on our Facebook page occasionally, in our monthly newsletter, The Voice, but a few to highlight this week. Uh, first, our Gingerbread House experience is happening this afternoon. I believe sign-ups have closed, yes? So you might be able to sneak in. It's a fun time. I did it a couple of years ago. You get sticky. It's great. <laughs> uh, following Sunday... <coughs> I've heard the rumor that Santa Claus will be visiting us in the afternoon, not long after the service. I think you can see we've already set up his special sitting area in the corner of the fellowship hall there. He's got this great brand new throne of a chair in there. It's amazing. And I've heard there may be a possibility he's coming with his sleigh as well. Uh, you do not need to sign up for this. You can just come and experience it. Uh, but do come around between 2 and 5 next Sunday for our visit from Santa Claus. And once again, our solstice celebration is coming up on the 21st, about 7 in the evening, and I'm still looking for volunteers. I've had several of you sign up already, but it takes a lot of hands to make this work, especially on the reception end of things with helping out with cookies and cider and things like that and some of the cleanup, but also fire building and fire tending and building the evergreen spiral and finding evergreen branches for us. If you've got any that you've got to spare as you set up your holiday uh, decorations, we need that too. Come and talk to me after the service. <coughs> so you can sign up on the Simple Ways to Serve board in the fellowship hall. 
and Christmas Eve service is coming. I have one person who signed up to read a portion of the gospel. Uh, I just got a wave from the tech booth. Someone else is, is volunteering to read, so we've got uh, a couple more positions available to read from the Christmas story. Two more there, going, going, gone. I solved that problem. All right. <laughs> Come remind me in the fellowship hall. Christmas Eve service will begin at 6.30, so we can end a little earlier than we normally do because I get tired. So Christmas Day, I want to remind you, we are closed. It's landing on a Sunday. I'd much rather spend it at home with my family. I'm sure you would too. And so we will gather together on New Year's Day the following week for a service then. And now would you all please rise once more in body and spirit and join us in our closing hymn number 331. Friends, may life bless us and keep us. May the light of life shine upon us and out from within us and be gracious to us and bring us peace. For this is the day. This is the one wild and precious life we have all been given. So let us all find a way to rejoice and be glad in it. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.